So there's a lot of different addiction issues going on in the world. Today, we're gonna to emphasize primarily the opioid epidemic. And we're gonna go through a timeline of how we got to where we are today, and then heavy, heavily emphasize what the solution is, okay? So we're gonna start one way to win the war on drugs, just one way. One of the problems with addiction and, and, and issues we have going on is it's too complicated. It's too many different things going on that confuse people. And so we're gonna make this as specific and as simple as possible, that's why we like to call it One Way. Timeline from how we got here starts with a man by the name of Hans Kosterlitz. He was a German-British scientist. In the 1960s, he developed something that he called My Secret Idea. Now, starting in 1954, scientists were looking for the reasons why heroin works. You know, they were examining the brain and they came across or they were at least considering the idea that there's receptors that there's a spot in the head where heroin and opioids go to activate the opioid response. And so they were, they were considering in 1954 the idea of receptors. Well, in the 60s, Kosterlitz was pursuing this idea and his, his secret idea that he came up with was that there must be something naturally occurring in the brain that's supposed to fit these receptors, okay? So he was speculating, the word wasn't there yet, but he was speculating on what this, this thing called endorphins were, but it was kept quiet for a very specific reason. He thought his fellow scientists would think he was crazy. In fact, he thought most people think he was crazy to suggest that there was an opioid-like substance naturally occurring in the brain. So he kept it quiet. And for about 15 years or so, he, he just did this work by himself, maybe with a few colleagues, but he didn't want to share it. So he kept it a secret. Didn't think anyone would believe it. In 1972, Time Magazine did a war, uh, did a um, cover on the global war on heroin. And so it's an interesting article, scary article, right? The global war on heroin. And it talks about how difficult the, uh, the opioid crisis was. At that time, I personally would have thought the global war started in like the late 90s or the early 2000s, but no, it's clearly going on for a long time, 1972. Now they did not know at that time that in 1973, the answer, the cure was gonna be found in the form of endorphins, because one year later they were discovered. In the, in the meantime, what the government's strategy was to, to win the war on um, heroin was to confiscate all the heroin. Now, this is something we tried back in the 1920s with alcohol during prohibition, right? Collect the booze, nobody will drink it. And that didn't work so well, right? So they overturned that. Well, that's what the government and a lot of this article was talking about. Get rid of all the heroin and then people won't use it. Not a very good strategy. And the government since then has spent a trillion dollars on the war on addiction and the opioid war. So when endorphins were discovered in 1973, we came across the answer. But it was not something, it's not been something that's been developed very well since. It's been 50 years now when endorphins were discovered. Turns out Kosterlitz was correct. His secret idea turned out to be true. We do have natural opioids in our brain, and it's called endogenous morphine, endogenous meaning within. And so we have opioid-like substance in our brain, and Kosterlitz and a few other uh, teams of scientists were able to figure that out. Now, at that time, they also, when they discovered the, the receptor for this, they called it the opioid receptor. And I ask, and it's one of the big issues why, uh, why we still are struggling and losing this war today, is that we still call it the opioid receptor. It's an endorphin receptor. Endorphins are supposed to go there. I don't call my stomach a cheeseburger receptacle because that's what I put there. We shouldn't call it an opioid receptor because that's what we put there. It's an endorphin receptor, that's what we're for. We need to change the language. Scientists gotta get together and they need to make this change, start calling it an endorphin receptor. Now, I've looked since 1973 all over the place for like articles or just headlines, Time Magazine again, for to, to describe that sure enough, that the endorphin was discovered and there aren't any magazine covers. And you'll see as we talk about it, it's the cure, it's the solution, why it works. And yet we have only one magazine on time that I was able to find in 2016, they identified or they call it the exercise cure. But I read the article and I didn't see the word endorphins mentioned at all. In fact, exercise produces endorphins in a high amount. And yet the article doesn't even mention it. In my opinion, this is still secret. Kosterlitz thought in the 1960s that it was going to be an idea considered to be crazy, and here we are 50-some years later, and I think people still think it's crazy. And so we don't have magazine covers that are, that are talking about it. We have magazine covers like this one, 
Discover Magazine looking for a safer opioid. We aren't going to find safer opioids. If anything, we're finding more dangerous ones. We already found the safer opioid in 1973 when endorphins were discovered because that's the only opioid that's supposed to be in the brain and we're not talking about it enough. So I'm going to explain now in one minute how endorphins work using junk that I found in my house, okay? And so it's not that difficult. It's an extremely difficult problem for most people, but they don't realize how easy the solution is. And we're going to start with something really simple. Again, scientists tend to make scientific things too sciencey, and it goes over the head of most people. I've worked with thousands of opioid addicts, and they don't need to hear all the complicated stuff. They just want to understand the basics. And here's the basics. Simply put, using a lock and key, okay? Our brain has receptors. There's an endorphin receptor right there. Not an opioid receptor, an endorphin receptor. And the endorphin fits into it. And it has a shape to it, just like the lock uh, has a shape. We all understand how that works. And once that key goes into the lock, we have an effect. So simple, okay? And so that's how endorphins and other neurotransmitters work in the brain. Let me show you opioid addiction. So here's another lock and key example. This is just a battery and a battery charger. And so we have something fitting into the slot and now we have an effect. That's how the normal brain works. But when someone uses opioids, which happen to be shaped like endorphins, that's the key. The actual way the key is cut fits into the same spot. Well, all these other batteries here can also fit into this slot. When we put too much opioid in the brain, we end up developing a receptor mechanism that looks more like this, okay? Look at all these different holes. And so now to be satisfied, I don't just put one of these guys in there, I have to fill them all up. And if I fill them all up, I end up producing more receptors. This is what tolerance is, okay? And it's the problem, but it's also the solution. Because when we do this, our brain's natural endorphins decrease. And so we don't feel, feel like we can produce it. We can't produce it anymore. And here's where we find the solution. If endorphins go away, we feel sick because the brain doesn't have the ability to feel itself naturally anymore. So now we just use more opioids. Now, it's really simple to understand. And again, the thousands of people I work with, they get it pretty quickly. But we don't have a community that supports this idea. Big Pharma has to know this. Now, I'm thankful for all the wonderful medicines they've produced over the years, but they have to know the science. I'm a former sports writer with a bunch of people in recovery, and we were able to figure it out. Surely they know this, and yet they're not advertising it. They're not promoting it. They're not telling us that endorphins have been discovered. We have here several different meds, meds that I got myself that were for Oxycontin here, Vicodin, Ultram. And on none of these labels does it say, warning, use of this product might decrease your natural endorphin production, okay? That would be helpful because that's what withdrawal is all about and why we continue to perpetuate uh, uh, addiction in this country, especially the opioid uh, epidemic, is because we're not telling people what happens when they use this stuff. They'll get addicted, but people don't know what that means. Your own natural endorphins decrease in amount if you use these pills, and it should be right there on the label, just like we did with cigarettes. People should be told this so they know this. Now here I have videos for Suboxone and Vivitrol, again, medicines that, are, that are, work well for various people, and you have these little pamphlets inside these. This is a Vivitrol little um, information manual, and we've all seen this before. Look at the words on that, so super small. Nowhere on this do I see the word endorphin. Again, these companies have to know about endorphins. Here is the one for Suboxone, same thing. And if you open it up and you have all these words and all these little pictures that describe everything, but they do not tell us anywhere in here what happens if you use this medicine and how it's gonna cause some, it could very potentially cause some issues. It needs to be on here. In fact, it needs to be the headline for Time Magazine. It needs to be warning labels. It needs to be all over the place talking about this because that's the solution. And plus, we have to start giving these medicines practical names. We call them things like Oxycontin and, and, uh, and, and fentanyl and, and Percocet and Vicodin and all of that. And the truth is, that confuses people. I know people who don't know the difference between methadone and methamphetamine, and yet they're incredibly different, but the names are close. How about we make a decision to start calling these what they are? Opioids are fake endorphins. 
It's what they are. And we should have different intensities, baby. Fake endorphin one, fake endorphin two, fake endorphin three. What would happen if we got a whole community, the whole government talking about this and calling these medicines what they are instead of these names that confuse people? We gotta put on warning labels and we gotta change the names and we gotta tell people that the solution is inside our own brains. That's where we get to this one strategy, okay? One means only need endorphins. Couldn't be any more simple. When we get hooked on, on opioids, our natural endorphin production uh, shuts down. The way to beat and win the war is to produce more endorphins, simple enough. And people who produce lots of endorphins feel better. It's very logical. It fills those receptors. You produce lots of endorphins, you feel better. One solution. So what's our one strategy? Promote endorphin production. Doctors need to talk about this. Teachers, administrators, family, friends, uh, pastors, just everyone needs to be talking about endorphin production as the solution to the opioid war. That's, that, could be the, that is the only solution. There could be nothing else. We need to be talking about that. And the good news is there's dozens of ways to do this. Here's just a list. There's a lot. We've come up with several dozen um, scientifically studied ways to produce positive brain chemistry. And on this list, we have the basics, things like exercise and nutrition. Heck, the exercise cure was super close. Too bad they didn't link that to the opioid war. Exercise, nutrition, meditation, music, playing music and writing music, creativity, artwork, um, good sleep habits, self-esteem, picking a goal, accomplishing the goal feels good. So we have to create more goals for ourselves so we can succeed at things. That feels good, produces endorphins. Being in the sun produces endorphins. Massage feels good, produces endorphins. Drinking water produces a little bit of endorphins. Spiritually speaking, and again, this needs to be go through schools because these are just virtues. It doesn't have to be religion. Spirituality linked to inner world work in the form of virtues produces endorphins. Compassion, hope, gratitude, forgiveness, integrity, wisdom, patience, and love, those all produce endorphins. This needs to be in first grade, in second grade, in third grade. Here's a curriculum, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be all day long, but how about a class on mental health and addiction and, and uh, just what healing looks like by doing all this kind of stuff? Because it's positive brain chemistry. And I saved my favorite for, for last year, laughter. We all like laughter. Laughter produces endorphins. In fact, laugh a lot and get a little high on it. Get a little addicted to it too. We need, we need to make recovery more fun. It's not fun enough. Instead of scare tactics, we have to work with people on doing all these healthy, positive, productive things. This is why we like to call it both the prevention and the solution. Now you've heard the, the, the cliche, but it's true. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Well, in, the, in, in this uh, mindset, especially looking back at the 50 years of a trillion dollars spent by our government, an ounce of prevention could be worth a trillion dollars, okay? Moving forward, everybody has the ability to heal themselves. If we would just promote endorphin production activities in recovery, in schools, you know, in doctor's offices, and, and, and big pharma participating, how about they put out, you know, billions of dollars worth of advertising, okay? We'll shut down this opioid, opioid epidemic real fast, okay? So it is preventative because the more we gear ourselves up with endorphin production when we're younger, say eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, and we know things like gratitude and hope and, and, and uh, compassion actually produce and, and give us a preventative mechanism for, for addiction, then that's a wonderful thing to teach in school. But once somebody gets hooked and they have the disease of opioid dependence, it's also the solution. The only way out is to produce more of that natural chemical. And by the way, one of the things the scientists got addicted to is talking about dopamine so much. And the truth is that dopamine's involved in any addiction. And if you get excited to produce more endorphins, you'll produce dopamine, and then you'll get addicted to endorphin production. It's self-sustaining, right? And so pulling it all together, that's why we keep it nice and simple. There's a lot of talk. There doesn't, doesn't need to be any more than this. It's as simple as one, one way, only need endorphins.